Welcome to the Sega Lounge, where we celebrate our love for all things Sega, including the games, the music, and the community. I'm your host, KC. Join me as I talk to different guests and learn more about their projects and passion for Sega. Hello and welcome to the Sega Lounge. This is episode 237. My name is KC, and this is a very special episode. We're here to celebrate this little guy. Yeah, it's the Dreamcast and the 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 better one, right? The proper true swirl, the the like this blue swirl master race. Uh, <laughs> I'm starting in a controversial manner already. Anyway, it's the 25th anniversary of the Dreamcast in Europe, and I thought, and and I'm I'm saying this as a person who has done this in in the past. We usually most people usually focus on the the American launch of the the system nine nine ninety nine right. It's easier. It's got a nice little ring to it. Uh, but I'm based in Europe, and I have a lot of friends who are also based in Europe. And this year, I decided to focus more on the European side of things since it's the the big twenty fifth anniversary. Uh, so I've invited a couple of or three friends to to join me to talk about the the Dreamcast and their experiences with the launch and beyond. Before we get into that, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can support the show by going to the segalaunch.com slash support. So if you want to just like buy us a coffee, buy some cool merch, right? Cool Sega Lounge branded merch to celebrate the 10th anniversary, feel free to. Uh, either way... We love you. Thank you very much for listening and or watching the episode. So let's get into the celebrations. And joining me, we have a panel of illustrious guests. Uh, from my left to my right, we have Lewis Cox. Hello, Lewis of the Dreamcast Junkyard. Hi. Hello. Happy to be back. I don't actually know which which uh, time, how many times I've been on uh, yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how not, many times I've been on at this point. Yeah, not enough, uh, not but enough. I'm happy to be back. And I just wanted to say, your Dreamcast seems to have survived, um, you know, the test of time better than mine, which I actually have to hand. Yeah. I don't know if you can you can actually see it best there. You see the difference in color. That's yeah. wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the modem looks really nice, though. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, welcome, Lewis. Thank you for joining us. Uh, really nice to, always nice to have you here. And always nice to have our next guest, Andrew Dickinson. Hello, Andrew. Hello, it's been a while as well. I think I can't remember the last time I was on, but it's uh, it's good to be back again. Thank you for having me. Excellent. How is your Dreamcast holding up? Uh, it's okay, I've got three. So I'm, I'm sure one of them is fine. <laughs> but I haven't looked, I haven't brought mine with me and like uh, you two, so yeah. Okay. I, I actually unplugged mine and gave it a, a nice little like uh, swipe of a, a rag over the top just <laughs> so it looked a little bit better and not as dusty as it usually is. But I love this That's thing. Fair. Yeah. Okay. And joining us for the first time from Spain and from Sonic Paradise, a well known Sonic uh, website, Ash the Dragon. Hello, Ash. Hi. I am very happy to be here with you all. I have to say, I mean, my English is not that good, but I will try to <laughs> to do the best I can. It's it's great. It's great. We can understand you perfectly, and we're really happy to have you here to share a little bit more about something that maybe we don't talk about that that often, which is like what happened in uh, countries other than the UK when we talk about the the European launch and beyond, right? Uh, but uh, the life of the Dreamcast. So we have two representatives of other countries, including myself, to talk a little bit more about, <laughs> about that. Really excited to share some some info on that. So we'll, as, as people know, listeners of the show know, structure is not one of my strong suits. However, I usually start the show with a little like a, an outline that I put together and th that I shared with you guys. So let's start with that and then we'll we'll go from there and see if we can throw this out the window at some point and and focus on on other things. But this will try to be 
uh, a little bit more like lighthearted about this, sharing more of like our own experiences uh, above all. Uh, there are some very cool uh, pieces of content being shared these days. We're actually recording this on the actual date on the 14th of October, 2014. So to this day that we're recording this, the Dreamcast is 25 years old in Europe. Uh, and people, uh, content creators across the interwebs have been releasing some interesting uh, videos and podcasts. Um, check out the Dreamcast Junkyards episode. Really nice uh, listen. Really enjoyed. And thanks for the shout out, guys, by the way. Um, <laughs> also, the Sega guys have put out a couple of videos as well, I think, about that, the launch of the Dreamcast in Europe. So those are probably more comprehensive, like history-focused uh, pieces of content. We're going to go with a little bit more like a fun outlook on things. We'll see. We'll see. Also, before we get into this, I have to say I hate you guys for in agreeing to come here on this day, because... Throughout the day, I started to feel the need to play my Dreamcast tonight. <laughs> but because we're recording this, I can't. So you could have said You're no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start with a little brief intro uh, about each of us and where we were um, when the Dreamcast launched. So 25 years ago. Let's try to uh, like go back into into the headspace of whatever age you were at that time and, and see if we can remember. Uh, for example, let's start, maybe let's start with you, Andrew. Um, where were you? Were you aware of the Dreamcast launching that day? Were you a Sega fan before that? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I was aware of it, but only in the back of my mind because I wasn't really a Sega fan at that point. Um, I had my PlayStation and I was totally happy with my PlayStation at the time. Um, I had no reason to get a Dreamcast. So on the actual launch day 25 years ago, I'd have been at school, I was 15. Um, was I 15? I might have been, six. no, I was 15. I was definitely 15. When you get, when you get as think old you, as we I are. I think you were, because we're the same age, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, when, we get, when you get to our age, you just forget, um, time is nothing anymore. Um, but yeah, so I was 15 and uh, happily playing my PlayStation. Um, I can't remember what games there were around that time. I know that not long after the launch of the Dreamcast, there was Resident Evil 3 and Final Fantasy VIII and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I was doing. Um, it wasn't until the following year that I actually got one. Um, but I do remember like all of the stuff in the magazines at the time, like Games, uh, Games Master and um, CBG and stuff like that. They were talking about the Dreamcast and how awesome it was going to be. And I was like, cool, okay. But I, I paid very little attention beyond that, unfortunately, at the time. So... Okay. Were you a Sega fan before that? So no, before the PlayStation, I was Nintendo. Uh, we had a <laughs> NES and a SNES. I once borrowed my stepsister's uh, Mega Drive, and I think we played it for a week because we, we swapped basically. We had a SNES, she had a Mega Drive, so we swapped for a week. Um, and so it good fun, but then after the week, I was happy to have Mario back. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Traitor. Uh, oh, and by the way, and by the way, I introduced everyone's projects, but I didn't mention, for example, one of your many projects. You're also you part of the it. junkyard, but also the Dreamcast yes. years. We're matching today, look at that. There oh, we go. Yeah, there we go. The same there we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote it, and I don't even have that in my office with me. How bad is that? <laughs> That's Showing called being modest. You're not like, oh, look, look at the book that I wrote. That, that's that's not really that. The, no. the only thing I have even close, hang on, I'm just going to dip, dip out of frame. For some reason, I have these next to me, but like I have art prints of the book I haven't even let, released let, yet. So. Oh, my God. That, that's oh. <laughs> that's nice. That's an awesome so that. to be cover. Yeah, yeah. that looks yeah. really nice. It looks really nice. Yeah. And, and I, I brought this up because this is a very good. Uh, so Dreamcast Year One is a very good place to research some of the stuff that we're talking about today including like mm. launch games and stuff so uh, thank you andrew for this as well <laughs> okay moving on uh so ash where were you 25 years ago <laughs> well i was a bit i'm going to be the black sheep because i was that sega 
but I think I am not the only one. <laughs> back, uh, back there, I was a Pokemon freak. So I was full on on Nintendo consoles and Nintendo games, especially Game Boy um, and Pokemon. So I wasn't very aware about Dreamcast back then. But by bits and there, I, I saw like get the games and the console and said, that, that, that's good, I, I like that. Sadly, I never got a Dreamcast back at that time. But I got sort of a Dreamcast a bit later because I, I got a GameCube. And <laughs> I only have Sega games. So it's like I had a Dreamcast, but in a cube form. Okay, okay, excellent. So you only had uh, Sega games for the GameCube? Yes, when the first time, yes. I had later on, I have more Nintendo games, but the games I bought the game with was Sonic Adventure 2 Battle and Crazy Taxi. So it, it was, it was nice. a drink test. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Uh, was Sega big in Spain by that time? Yes, uh, it was. Yeah. Not, not at that time, but Sega was very big back in the Mega Drive and Master System time. Back when the, with the Dreamcast, it was lower because there was a big backlash with the Saturn. But uh, mm. people still care about Sega. Okay. They're coming for us now. They're coming for yeah. us. We have That's to run. The, on my YouTube channel, we call it the uh, Retropolis. Okay. Whenever we say something, <laughs> the Retropolis comes out. <laughs> this is Woodwork City. We're in the streets of rage tonight. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Ash, for, for sharing. Uh, Lewis, what about you? Tell us your tale of not being a Sega fan. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I grew up I've, similar to Ash, Ash actually. Uh, Pokemon was like all the rage amongst people of my uh, age group. I think I, I've said before, I, was a, I think I was seven when the Dreamcast released um, in, in Europe. Um and yeah, but I, I, I've explained before on the Sega Lounge that I used to watch my granddad play games and he was big on the PS1, games like Tomb Raider, um, you know, and I loved watching him play those. Um, and then also around my friends' houses, everyone had a PlayStation. Um, you know, I remember like loving Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 and Time Crisis and... Uh, in, and the only real Sega console I'd played was my granddad did have a Saturn, but I don't ever remember watching him play it. But me and my cousin played Virtual Cop 2 on that, and that was amazing because I had already been exposed to Time Crisis. And I love light gun stuff, and I was like, wow, you know, we're playing this together. We both had light guns, so that was pretty awesome. And um, the other Sega thing I was exposed to, because I don't r remember the Mega Drive at all from when I was that age, and but I used to love the show Sonic Underground on the TV, and I used to like always sing the theme song because it was radical. So that was my kind of exposure to Sega, and then the next thing was the Dreamcast. So yeah. Do you want to grace us with a little bit of that theme song? Okay. I don't. I don't actually know the lyrics. All I know is Sonic <laughs> Underground, and I can't remember the rest. That's it. That that's basically is. That's basically it. Yeah. And there was like a, a green a green hedgehog or something called Axel. Was that the was that the the show? Yeah, it's been a the, long time since I've watched it. The, there were three. So Sonic and his siblings, right? Sonia, yeah. mm. Manic, was it Manic? Manic. Yeah, that sounds. I think right. so. Yeah, yeah, the green one. Yeah, I think so. It's been a while as well. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. been a while. <laughs> okay, okay. So we, we've pretty much established no one, uh, none of us are Sega fans. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> we all are. But I was I was actually a Sega fan before this, the Dreamcast. And um, I'm going to share this one more time, once again. So for people who have been listening to this since, to the Sega launch since forever, they already know. But I, I was a big Sega fan growing up. Started with the Mega Drive, Sonic was the thing, right? But then I skipped the Saturn, and not just the Saturn, but the whole generation. So I didn't have any consoles during that generation. Um, but by 1998, perhaps, so I, I always kept in touch with what was happening in the world of video games uh, through TV shows that we had here in Portugal that showed what was happening with the Saturn as well. Uh, 
video game magazines as well. I I bought some of those and I always kept an eye on what was happening. Uh, and when I realized that Dreamcast was coming in 1999, uh, I knew I had to get back on <laughs> on the, the Sega train. And um, and I thought the way that it was, I, I, I don't know if it's how it was promoted over here. I don't think so. But in my mind, in my head, I thought, oh, this is it. This is the comeback. This is the big comeback for Sega. This is going to be it. The the 128-bit generation will be it for Sega. Let's go. And so I I was actually working, uh, not working. I, I was doing like a, a professional course here, which had, uh, I had a, like a scholarship and I saved my money, like most of that m monthly uh, allowance that I got, um, saved most of it so I could buy a, a Dreamcast. Not at launch, sadly, because I, I didn't have the money yet, but a few months after. So and it was the first console that I bought with my own money, which is something that I'm still very proud of and, and it has a special place in my heart because of that. Uh, and so I, I was pretty much into the Sega of it all, although it was mostly promoted as Dreamcast only, right? But it, for me, it was always the Sega Dreamcast. It's like part of my childhood and part of the legacy that I grew up with. Um, so that my story is a little bit different, right? So going back to you guys, when did you guys get your Dreamcast? So Andrew, back to you. When did I get my Dreamcast? Um, it was the next year, so it was my 16th birth birthday. <clears throat> and this is probably a story, again, if people have listened, so I think I told it on an episode that I was uh, on with you, Casey. So if you've already heard me speak about this, you're going to hear me say it again. But um, I feel like I've repeated this story about a million times at this point. Um, but I basically, I wanted a Dreamcast because Resident Evil Code Veronica was announced to be coming to it. And I was a huge Resident Evil fan. Um, had been for a couple of years by that point uh, it was crazy into it so i was like well if it's exclusive for the dreamcast then obviously i have to have a dreamcast because that's the only way i'm going to play it so um i essentially begged my mum to get me one for my 16th birthday and we went i think it was two or three months early to like a uh like a secondhand game store in our town um because obviously by that point it was nearly a year old uh, my birthday was in august and we went maybe in april may time to go get it for some reason i don't know why so it was kind of like six months seven months old by that point and uh so i i basically went into this store with my mum and picked up a second hand dreamcast uh along with um i got crazy taxi and power stone they were like oh if you you know if you're buying a second hand one we'll give you two games with it and i was like oh great took it home um and it stayed in my mum's wardrobe for about a day and then i basically said can i take it out and test to make sure it worked because it's second hand right you know you have to you have to check these things to make sure they work that's um, smart that's really smart exactly yeah so i ended up getting like an hour or so playing uh power City taxi and actually within that time i fell in love with it i'd never played games like those before and i was like this is incredible so before my actual birthday i think i managed to persuade my mum to let me get it out several times uh giving different excuses every time as to why i needed to play it uh once my friend was over and i was like well i need to test if both controllers work so i need to like play power <laughs> boat <laughs> and uh, so me and my friend managed to play it before my birthday anyway yeah so I, I got it on my 16th birthday but technically i played it like a couple of months before that and uh yeah, and I, and I also made her get it out when the Code Veronica demo came out on the mm -hmm. official Dreamcast magazine um, on the disc, and I was like, I need to play this demo. Uh, so yeah, she let me play that as well. To, to so see my if mom it works. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll walk over back then. <laughs> I think she's a bit wise. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, what about you, Ash? When did you get your first Dreamcast? My first Dreamcast, I got it pretty late because but I had a GameCube, but uh, I got it around 2006 or so when I started retro collecting. 
I started to look about the uh, games from the past. I was a very big fan of Sonic back then, thanks to playing Sonic Adventure 2 of Dreamcast. Uh, I also had, uh, had Sega Harbor from before because my first console was a Master System. So I already knew of Sonic and Sega. So then I decided to look at the things I have uh, missed at the past, out the Sega past, and got a, a Mega Drive, I got a Dreamcast and a Saturn. So I started to, to look more into the Sega history of games back then. So it was late, but I got to play the game <laughs> around the time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay. Excellent, excellent. Lewis, what about you? Um. I played the Dreamcast first at a friend's house, like a family friend. It was these two brothers that I was like great friends with. And um, they they had the Dreamcast and I went over and, um, you know, we were playing a lot of like multiplayer games on there. Uh, Power Stone and Quake 3 Arena were like the highlights. And yeah, it was a blast. I remember absolutely loving any time i could go around there and and to play it and um you know i went had like sleepovers and we just played it all night and it was amazing um power stone 2 specifically was the game that they had they had um uh, uh, they got that and that was like amazing i know it's like a controversial opinion to like that one as much as the first but <laughs> the fact that you could play with more people was like the thing for me the fact you can play with four people um yeah and so uh, there it is yeah um uh, and so after that i i moved away unfortunately so there was and i don't know i think i guess maybe i thought that like I'd get to play it again, but uh, no one I knew had one. They all had PS2s because that was the that was the thing, wasn't it? And um, I mentioned previously on on Sega Lounge that like my mum didn't really want me to get game consoles because um, she wanted me to focus on school and stuff, and probably thought that's, they'd like rock my parenting. brain. Yeah. yeah, well, exactly. They probably she probably thought they'd like rock my brain or whatever. Um, and so I never actually got one around the time it was it was um, contemporary, which wasn't that long. Mm. I've come to realize, <laughs> and um, and I, and I actually this is one thing I remembered actually the other day was I feel like I remember we were like she was driving somewhere and she'd like hear things on the radio and and tell me about it. Like I remember she was saying, "Oh, I heard that the Game Boy Color's being discontinued, and now there's going to be the Game Boy Advance," and I was like. Oh, cool. But then well, I swear there was one time where she went, oh, I've heard the Sega Dreamcast has been discontinued. And at the time I thought, what? Like, this is the coolest console ever. Like, you know, all them all them games I play with my friends. How did this fail? You know, this is awesome. And so, yeah, I, I, I vividly remember her telling me that. And, um, and so, yeah. And then later on, I think it's like sort of early 2010s. I was at college. I had my first job. And I uh, just was rediscovering games. And so I bought a Dreamcast and then I was able to reintroduce, re well, I reintroduced myself to it and then introduced all my friends to, to all these games. And so we were playing all the, the games and I kind of got a reputation. It's like, oh, if you go around Lewis's, he's going to make you play Power Stone 2. Sort of, <laughs> but they, they all loved it. Like those guys like were like, you know obsessed with it as i was you know and they they all had like the characters they'd play as and you know yeah so it was good fun mm -hmm. that's awesome that's great yeah i i as i said before i was really hyped for the the console i sadly couldn't get one at launch but i and i i said this before i got a game before i got the console i got i bought sonic adventure which sat on my desk for a few months, like, so I could feel like a failure. I had the game, but I couldn't play it. It was really, really, really upsetting, to be honest. But, because uh, <laughs> I, I remember going to, uh, I can't really remember exactly which uh, place I got it from. And the game and the console, I can't really remember exactly where. It was probably at, at like one of the local shopping malls. Uh, but I remember going there uh, frequently because I was 
uh, I was doing an internship and then afterward I usually passed <laughs> the the shopping mall I went in and I went to one of the, the like the game shop stores and I looked at the Dreamcast and like oh my god now I want to play Sonic Adventure because I'm I'm such a big Sonic fan and this looks awesome and I remember on TV and everywhere the big thing about Sonic Adventure was the the whale chase scene right in Emerald Coast um and I oh my god there were like kiosks and I tried to play the, the game a little bit um and so I ended up getting the game before getting the console <laughs> uh, which was an interesting move not sure if smart or not but I read that manual like over and over again I even uh, bought and this one's for you Ash because I I bought uh I don't know if it was like the official Dreamcast magazine or something unofficial but it was like a Dreamcast themed magazine in Spanish that wound up somewhere in a, like a, a newsstand uh, in Lisbon. And I got one of those that was like dedicated to Sonic Adventure. And it came with like a guide uh, with each story. And so I tried not to spoil my, myself in terms of story, but I, I remember reading little bits of each of the six character stories and the levels and looking at that and like salivating, like, oh my God, I need to play this game. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I ended up buying it, I believe, uh, around close to my birthday as well. Uh, so my birthday is in May. I probably got it at around March or April or something, um, which was really nice. I, uh, like a sense of <laughs> uh, achievement or something that I got when I finally got the money to... To buy this was was amazing. Do you guys remember? Uh, and I know probably Lewis and Andrew, you you remember even because maybe you you talked on this during the the, the dream pod. But uh, do you guys really even remember in your memories anything related to the launch of the Dreamcast? Anything on TV, on magazines, anything that you even remotely remember seeing at around that time? Uh, I don't I remember. Yeah, I yeah. remember watching exactly the whale chase at Sonic Adventure. It was at a, a video rental store I went. They had the drink. They imported it from Japan, and it was earlier than the European uh, date. And I remember watching it there and and looking at this and saying, "Wow, Sonic's so cool now," <laughs> because I remember Sonic from the Master System. So I, I loved it. But never got the step to say I want to buy it. Just just look at it and say it's just too cool. And the intro for Sonic Adventure intro movie that that was amazing back then. I saw it uh, was amazing. But what I saw there. That's also, true. we had uh, TV adverts. <laughs> okay. Okay. Back in Spain. Uh, specifically dedicated to Sonic Adventure or the Dreamcast. Uh, about Dreamcast. But I think I saw Sonic Adventure one or two. Two. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 And the and the magazine, the official drink up magazine, you got one. <laughs> but we had that uh, at the at the stores and around that. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about you guys? I think Lewis was about to say something as well. I was about to defer to Andrew because <laughs> all I all I knew was through osmosis of my my friend having one. Mm -hmm. I, I I probably saw some of the adverts in the magazines at the time because um, I know I mean I've, I see them now obviously in the official Dreamcast magazine that I have because uh, I've got like the whole collection but they obviously ran those adverts in uh, you know uh, Games Master CVG all those kind of magazines so I do, I don't remember remember but I know that I probably did see them uh, my memory of being fifteen is is very very hazy um so but i do i i would have seen those adverts in those magazines at the time and those were some interesting adverts that they ran in the magazines uh for the uk uh yeah some some interesting ones i know that they had yeah. like Bert in front of um 
but unfortunately I wasn't a Star Wars fan at the time. Um, so I didn't go see Phantom Menace. So I didn't see the advert. So what I'm doing is I'm telling you what I didn't see or what I think I did see. Less about <laughs> yeah. I, I saw Phantom yeah. Menace, so I should have seen the adverts, but I cannot remember. So I didn't see Phantom Menace at the, the theater either, so... You didn't experience much. that. Yeah, I know, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I I also don't really remember remember like properly remember anything mm. in terms of adverts. Um, I know there were some. Uh, I remember what one piece of like advertisement that I remember seeing was like flyers at game stores. So uh, in Portugal, we had. Sega Portugal, which was nothing but a company like uh, who licensed the Sega brand and acted at Sega as Sega of Portugal, called Echo Films, um, which you guys mentioned during the the Dream Pod as well. So uh, Echo Films um, did their own uh, marketing as well. We actually had like sp Echo Films made uh, kiosks for the Dreamcast at certain places. And that I remember, I remember some flyers uh, that like were Dreamcast branded and showed some of the games, but I don't, don't really remember uh, specifically like TV adverts ahead of launch. Uh, I probably, I think I remember something Sonic Adventure <laughs> related because Sonic was big here. Uh, and even the Saturn was really big in Portugal until some point. And then the PlayStation took over, but at like the first two, three years, probably, uh, Saturn was really successful here in, in Portugal. Um, but I, I also remember there was a, a TV show called uh, Temple do Jogos, so it's like the Temple of Games, uh, and they showed a lot of Dreamcast games. I remember seeing Power Stone, Sonic Adventure, uh, Soul Calibur is one that stuck in my head as well. Uh, probably Toy Commander as well, I remember. And maybe Trick, trick Style, probably. So, and those I think were shown ahead of launch uh, on that show, like previews. And when the, um, when the console launched in the US, like a month prior, they also covered that as well. So I do remember that. I don't remember anything fancy like launch parties or like any specific events. Like I know you guys had in the UK, uh, like like really decadent parties, perhaps. <laughs> I don't. I don't think there were like real celebrities over here at that time. <laughs> but I do. I do. Uh, so last week I was invited uh, on a on a, a Portuguese podcast to celebrate the. the the anniversary of Dreamcast as well. And something that I hadn't thought about in ages uh, came back because one of the guys mentioned it. So uh, 2000 was the, the, the year of the first edition of Big Brother in Portugal. Okay. I don't know when it uh, debuted in the UK or Spain, but in Portugal, 2000 was the year. And so in, so it was like, late 2000 and they had a dreamcast uh in the the big brother house and they the guys played they even played shenmue or tried to play shenmue because they didn't know how to play they were a little bit dumb uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh but they 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 had a dreamcast uh, in the big brother house which uh probably a genius move because it was like the biggest thing ever uh, in, uh, on Portuguese television it was like a, a, a real phenomenon and people were like every day trying to follow everything that happened with those guys. With those... It was like that in the UK as well. I remember my sister like yeah. printing out all the pictures and like crossing them off when they got evicted. <laughs> I don't remember a, a Dreamcast in the UK Big Brother house, but if it it wasn't no. a UK Big Brother house. It would have probably been used as a weapon against, because of the amount yeah. of fights that broke out and things thrown <laughs> on that show. <laughs> it would have been a weapon or something to drink out of, probably. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Wikipedia. The UK one launched the same year, so 2000. So, yeah, it would have been the okay. same time. Yeah. 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 Uh, Here yeah. 
we had a video game thing game in Big Brother 2, but it was a GameCube. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so basically a Dreamcast then, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we've established at this point, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I, I, so Big Brother is the same everywhere. There were fights here as well. One of the contestants was expelled because he, like, kicked one of the girls and, like, yeah. Wow. Nice, nice, classy, classy people. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like the cream of the crop. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, um, wh what about you, Ash? Any kind of memory of, like, any kind of event or something or party that you heard of even later? Yes, yes. Oh, I yeah. remember reading about uh, a beer launch party with... We had a, a Madrid amusement park for Rinkas lunch. Uh, I you know there was big, uh, they even have a, a person in a Sonic costume there. Uh, I know it was big. I was not there because I was young. I was two years, years old. But uh, <laughs> in journalism, went <laughs> and uh, I remember seeing photos about that in game magazine in that. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, obviously, so uh, um, the UK, the biggest one, but UK, France, Germany, and Spain were the, like the four big markets that um, <clears throat> Sega of Europe tried to push the Dreamcast. And like the, the launch launch parties there were, or launch parties made sense there because of that. Uh, I don't know if around other countries, and if you're listening to this and you're from one of the other countries, um, I said, wh which one did I say? I missed France as well, I think. Like, we're five, right? Yeah, UK, France, Probably. Spain, Germany. That was it, I think. Yeah, Spain as well? No. I thought, I yeah, so. Spain, Spain. And Italy, yeah, was, perhaps? Not Italy. Not Italy, Italy. Key okay. Market. Yeah, or Portugal. Probably Spain. Yeah. Portugal, Portugal, I think, was like one of the, like the second wave of like marketing in terms yeah. of budget or something. I believe. I think the the interesting thing about the European launch is because I suppose it's so vast, uh, like the PAL territory, and there's so many different languages. Is that from a from an English speaker's pers point of view, like to find information about certain areas um, that is more than just this was the distributor. These are the people who did the internet. Like so, to hear Ash talk about spain having like a launch party that's really interesting because i didn't i didn't actually find that in my research yeah yeah thanks for sharing that as well i i actually try to research a little bit in terms of what happened in portugal uh and it's it, we don't really have a lot of information like preserved even video game magazines i think we need to do a better job <laughs> at preserving those and and scanning them and, and getting them online. But I found a couple of um, newspaper articles. Um, so, for example, on uh, the 6th of September, 1999, uh, a journalist called Miguel Crispo uh, wrote for Publico, which is a, a newspaper over here, uh, and he actually said that uh, the first 128-bit console is going to be released by Sega on the 14th of October. Uh, initially to be launched on the 23rd of September, they actually uh, delayed the launch by three weeks. And that makes the expectation, the hype grow, he said. I don't know if he was right, but okay. Uh, <laughs> but he mentioned a couple of things that made the Dreamcast like a, a very... An enticing and exciting project. The first thing, uh, the the first console in the 128-bit generation, uh, Nintendo failed with the N64, he said. Boo, Nintendo. <laughs> uh, the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn were only 32-bit consoles, so pff, this is a, like a, an exponential <clears throat> growth in terms of power. Uh, also, it's exciting because in Japan and the U.S., he said, the Dreamcast hasn't been getting the success they hoped for. He wrote on the 6th of September, which means that 
the, the U.S. didn't have a Dreamcast yet. So <laughs> they, he wrote three days in advance that it wasn't really successful in the U.S. Of course not. They haven't launched it yet. So hold your horses. Uh, <laughs> I think the the launch was one of the launches of the Dreamcast were probably the most successful thing commercially for the console. I think for it sure. kind of petered out <laughs> after that, unfortunately. <laughs> You can't blame it on the launch like window. Everything went uh, amazingly, especially in the US and in Europe as well. Um, but th he also said we, we've tried several, uh, several of the 30 games which will be available at launch. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Maybe he means like launch window. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but they, he says the games, several of the games we've tried uh, left us with a very strong impression. So, yeah, that's nice. Um, and the peripherals. He talked about the VMU. And he also mentioned the online capabilities of the console, which was another thing that I wanted to mention. So, obviously, in the UK, uh, the, the online was available at launch-ish, I believe. Um, I don't know what happened in Spain. Do you know, Ash? Have you any idea if it was available at launch or not? Uh, the BMW, yes, it was available at launch. And people loved it. It was something uh, people who was not a really gamer or not a Sega fan that saw it at store or whatever, I liked it. Like it was sort of Tamagotchi that made them uh, interested in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What about the online modes? Where was online? Yes. Yeah, we at launch. It. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, we had a partnership between Sega and Telefonica to uh, avail a special offer to offer. Uh, um, I don't know how to say it in English. Like uh, unlimited uh, internet time from one hour to another hour. I don't know how to say that with the specific word, yeah. but uh, they commercialize it. Like, especially made for Trinca from this time to that time, you pay this and it's free to use the internet. Okay. And that, we had that too. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, so a Telefonica in Spain, BT in the UK, and Portugal PT, which is Portugal Telecom, doesn't yeah. exist anymore. It's like it's been called a couple of things since. Uh, and so, but in Portugal, uh, I found an article because I didn't remember, I knew it wasn't available at, at launch, but I found an article on another, um, another uh, newspaper and apparently it was available in November 2000. Uh, quite a while afterwards. Yeah. Thanks to a deal with, uh, with, between Echo Films and PT, um, and so it's interestingly enough they mentioned. So this was this article uh, is dated uh, the twelfth of November two thousand, and they mention, of course, because everything at that time mentioned anything Dreamcast mentioned the PlayStation two. So <laughs> they they say, oh, it's interesting that uh, less than two weeks uh, before the Dreamcast has to compete with the PlayStation 2 in Portugal. Uh, Sega now uh, has online capabilities on their Dreamcast. So maybe that will be uh, that will be a, like a, a strong point for the console in, and a way to combat the, the Dreamcast. Maybe. Spoilers. Not really. um, they actually mentioned sending, uh, receiving, and sending emails as a big thing you could do on the Dreamcast. Wow! Uh, <laughs> uh, did you guys ever, uh, like back in the day, not right now, but back in the day, you guys ever like used the Dreamcast as anything more than a, a games console? Did you use it like to surf the internet and? Yeah, I did yeah, not. I, I, I did not have a Dreamcast back then, but my partner, who is right here, he did, and uh, he was the his first contact with the internet. 
So he used Dream Arena to talk to people. Uh, he remembers a lot and always talking to me the uh, 11 9 uh, day, you know, the Twin Towers. How it was lived back at the Dreamcast, at the Dream Arena that day. He always talk about that. So yeah, and also how he worked emails, how he chat with other Sega fans, that he was really, really loving the internet capability of Dreamcast. Okay, awesome. Andrew? What about you? Yeah, I mean, I I used it to surf the internet a little bit. Um, I think I had a computer at that point, so I didn't use it a huge amount because although it was great, it was very like finicky and it, the screen wasn't great because everything was huge. On you were looking at it on a on your like living room TV, and all the text would be massive, and it was just like not laid out particularly well when you're kind of used to using the internet from a, a regular computer. But it was it was good that you had that ability and. I can only imagine that, like you say, um, Ash, people whose first interaction with the internet would be the Dreamcast. I know that in Japan, I think that was the case for some people as well. It was just, the, you know, the, the fact that you could plug that into your TV and access the internet. And in the UK, it was free as well. Um, BT basically um, allowed you to use the internet for, for free. Well, it's the price of the phone call, I think, but you didn't have to pay yeah. a, a charge for your ISP, which was, which was great. So... Yeah, I think I think I used it a little bit more because of that fact that you didn't have to pay the ISP charge. So occasionally I would I would use it instead of um, my usual computer. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, it's interesting that I, I found another article about the the, the Dreamcast's online capabilities, um, and they said that uh, the Dreamcast at the time. So this is the twentieth of November, two thousand. Uh, so Sega sold 15,000 consoles till the end of September in Portugal, but hoped to sell uh, 70,000 by uh, Christmas. Mm, not sure, uh, but maybe, maybe. I have no idea. I have no definitive numbers. So Portugal was the sixth European country to offer uh, online services on the Dreamcast, apparently. Yeah, and people who the the first thirty thousand to register, uh, thirty thousand consoles or players registered would get a free Dreamcast keyboard. Ooh. Nice, well done. Yeah. Uh, Se Sega got yeah. in trouble in the UK for their ad advertising slogan: "Sick up to six billion players." Um, <laughs> and uh, through our research, I mean, when we we've learned that. There was well, there wouldn't have been six billion players anyway, because if there was, <laughs> the Dreamcast would have lived. But um, you know, I think you said Andrew, like New Zealand didn't even get online at all. You know, so like even you, you're saying there, Casey, like Portugal didn't get it until like a year later. And as you kind of look into other countries, you know, in the PAL region, there's just so many where the the difference in support and and uh is just like completely different you know you've got what you know the the main co countries that had all these big parties and all the the internet worked and uh and then you just have like i don't know like we were saying new zealand who were just kind of over there left to have no internet no fun you know and so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh so I, when i was researching for this i i went back to episode 112 of the dream pod Actually, you were there, Andrew, with, with Tom, uh, and you talked to Giles Thomas, former yep. marketing director, I think, at Sega Europe. Mm. Uh, and he mentioned that, that he, his bosses, <laughs> when, when it came to, to going to, on the BBC, on the, the show Watchdog, right? Uh, his bosses left the building and he had to go there all by himself and defend the honor of, of Sega and the Dreamcast because <laughs> they weren't supposed to do that like fake advertising that it's up to 6 billion players. It, it wasn't even uh, possible to connect to other countries outside of Europe as well either, uh, right? So yeah. the infrastructure was Euro Europe only. So that yeah. even WC, if New Zealand great. could access the internet, yep. we yeah. wouldn't play against New Zealand like Kiwi players either. Wouldn't happen. And it was Anne Robinson who grilled Giles. I, I don't know if you've ever mm. seen her 
on like on a show the, the weakest, weakest link. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's scary. I mean, that was a yeah. whole thing, wasn't it? As a shtick that she was like this very stern, like you know, very um, sharp uh, woman, a presenter. But yeah, I wouldn't want to face her. <laughs> <laughs> interesting as well because the, the, the basically most of the trouble that sega got into was around the online thing because the reason as well that we didn't get the 9999 date was all because of the online aspect because bt weren't ready to roll out the internet and bt were working with the the other european countries in order to get the infrastructure ready for online and so they basically kept delaying because the online features weren't ready um mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the internet basically just got Sega into lots of trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually I didn't know uh, before I I listened to this episode of the Dream Pod. I I don't know when this launched, maybe like two years ago or something. Uh, I didn't know that Ann Robinson was like this on other shows. I thought that was like the because in Portugal the weakest link was hosted by different people throughout the years, mm -hmm. and they were all like very nice presenters. Wow. But for the weakest link, <laughs> they were like terrible, like sarcastic and like very serious, uh, just like Anne Robinson. But she was like this before the weakest link, apparently. I didn't know that. So, yeah. That's interesting. Interesting. Um, one last thing about this article that I found interesting is they talk about the games that you will potentially be able to play uh, in. Uh, online on the Dreamcast, uh, and they say for now just choo choo rocket. But uh, coming up soon, Quake Three Arena, Speed Devils Online, Fantasy Star Online, Pot Two, Arrow Wings, Air Strike, Star Lancer, Daytona Online, Eighteen Wheeler, um, and Black and White. And then they mention uh, not like playing. Uh, but online functions, so not gameplay, but functions, online functionalities, uh, in terms of MSR Metropolis, <laughs> MSR Metropolis, that's the name they go with <laughs> MSR Metropolis, uh, Sega GT, Jetset Radio, Shenmue, Sega Extreme Sports, and Virtual Athlete Two K. Okay, so they. Um, this is actually a very comprehensive article about the, the upcoming mm -hmm. online functionalities of the Dreamcast. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well done, Miguel Crisp. Very nice journalism <laughs> here. Yeah. Okay. And so let's let's move on to the games themselves. Uh, I know, uh, Lewis, we, we talked about this before the show, but there is a little bit like a... We're not really sure, I think, how many games were really launched on... 14, 10, 99. But uh, I'm going to go with, with uh, Andrew's take on this, with the 19 games that you mentioned in year one. Because even if they weren't exactly released uh, on launch date, but they were at least released, uh, released like close to launch yeah. date, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. As far as I could tell, that's what it was. It, trying to do the research for that, um, the, trying to find release dates for 25 year old games, or it was about 20 years old when I did the book, was ridiculously hard. They just don't exist in some places, and some people contradicted each other. Um, even now, if you go to Sega Retro, one part of their site states there were 12 launch games, another states there's 16. Exactly. Uh, so nobody can agree. <laughs> and those, those are the, those are the ones I found. I kind of like checked multiple sources and i was like mm -hmm. that's what i think it was but like you say even if that isn't the case they were probably within a week or so of, of launch some of those games mm -hmm. so they're basically yeah. basically launch games the the fir the closest i got to like a definitive list was the uh was it a dreamcast magazine in the uk had like a yeah. this is from the the charts of eb games and it had 12 but then like yeah. you know i've I've had people like Tom from the the junkyard say, "Oh, but I had this game, and that's not in the list," and, and you know stuff like yeah. that. So it's <laughs> and and, it's and you, you, everyone thinks Sega Bass Fishing was a launch game, which yeah, was yeah. delayed it and came like, out, also... it came out April the next year. So it definitely <laughs> yeah. wasn't. Memories are yeah. tricky. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess it's because of all the different regions. I don't know if that had anything to do with games being kind of all over the place with release dates. I'm not yeah. sure. Like I, I could have sworn that uh, Soul Calibur was a launch game, 
It wasn't in the US. Yeah, but it wasn't in Europe. So I, yeah. I remember it, it wasn't one of the big things that people talked about even before launch. So, and in my mind, it was a launch game. So I realized no, now that it wasn't. So the, the 19 games that uh, people can find, like add Dreamcast you one. It's not available anymore though, right? At least for now. Not physically, Not but physically. you can get the digital copy still. Yeah. Okay, so add, add. Uh, <laughs> get the digital, digital one. So incoming, Millennium Soldier Expendable, Mortal Kombat Gold, uh, Pen Pen Triathlon, Sega Rally 2, Sonic Adventure, Speed Devils, Tokyo Highway Challenge, Blue Stinger, Buggy Heat, Dynamite Cop, Hydro Thunder, Power Stone, Racing Simulation, Monaco Grand Prix, Ready to Rumble Boxing, Toy Commander, Trick Style, with a striker, Virtua Fighter 3 TB. These are the 19 probable games to be to have been released alongside the launch of the, the console. So I, I wanted to ask you guys, even if you didn't get the console on launch, even if you didn't play these games on launch, out of all of these, which one is your favorite, first of all? I think it's too easy to say Sonic Adventure, but <gasps> aside from that, uh, I like a lot Dynamic Cop. It's a great game. Hey, that's a nice shout. That's a nice shout. Uh, why? <laughs> because it's so crazy. It's, it's a very fun game. Uh, I already uh, knew about the uh, Dynamic uh, Dynamic here. Die Hard Arcade, right? Uh, on the Saturn. Yeah. I have to translate in my mind because in Spanish it's called Hunter de Cristal. So <laughs> we have to, it's, it's very Can you different. say that again? Can you say that again a little bit slowly? <laughs> Sorry. I, I say that I have to translate in no, no, my mind. No, but I, I asked the name, the name of the game in Spanish. Uh, Jungla de Cristal. How the name oh, of the, like the game. Crystal the Jungle? Movie. No. The, the, the original, the Saturn one, Funda de Cristal Arcade, uh, what, the what's first the meaning, uh, what's the meaning of uh, that? Game. Uh, and <laughs> I, I knew about that because of arcades. I did not play this Saturn. But okay. <laughs> uh, it was hard for me to say the name in, in English because it's different in Spain. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, uh, Die Hard Arcade uh, was a, a, actually quite fun game. Uh, I, I don't know if... if I, I think the the first one, I think Die Hard Arcade is a little bit, it's is less, uh, is more forgivable for me than Dynamite Cops. Like a little bit clunky, but it's fun. It's a fun game, right? I don't know. I don't know if I'm alone on this or not, but it's an interesting, it's, it's an good. interesting game. Yeah. yeah. I had to, I had to look this up. So the, 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 Sp the Spanish name that you just saying, so Jungle de Cristal, it translates to Jungle of Glass. Jungle okay. of Glass is the is the Crystal. Spanish title of Die Hard. <laughs> okay, okay. I said Crystal Jungle. I was close. Yeah. I suppose that makes <laughs> yeah. sense now I'm thinking about the film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like a, a big skyscraper filled with, he, like, what, he, with, with he, glass he, windows. He keeps walking on broken glass as well, doesn't he, at some That's point? True. Yeah, That's yeah. That's true. Yeah. Did it have yeah. a different name in Portuguese as well, or was it just called Die Hard there? We didn't have like trend, localized or translated uh, titles or games here, so okay. that's that's why we're familiar with the, the English titles and and character names and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, usually you had uh, things localized to Spanish, French, uh, German, and Italian. I think, I mm -hmm. believe so. Uh, even during the Master System and and Mega Drive games uh, era and Saturn. But we always got the English versions, and just like a very, like poorly printed out manual in black and white, which was translated to Portuguese. So the manuals we got it in in Portuguese, but everything else was in English. Yeah. Okay. We so got it in English yeah. too, but I remember it from the movie. <laughs> oh, okay. Excellent. Okay, so Dynamite Cop is Ash's pick. What about you, Lewis? Out of these nineteen, um, I think to be honest, Dynamite Cop is is excellent. Like you know, just 
it, that that to me is like the perfect kind of insane over the top game for me um and i probably have to say something like power stone but then again i like power stone 2 more so i might even lean towards sonic adventure i know it's like an uh, an unpopular opinion like that oh, game seems sure. to kind of that game kind of gets like um dumped on a lot online i know and you know it's it's not age well but i what what was what's andrew oh, oh. i dump on it <laughs> yeah uh, i i think it's good i i like sonic adventure um i mean you can't you can't not play that first level and just fall in love. And even some of the other levels after that, it's not just the one level. It's not just a, a one-trick pony game. Um, I also like that there's a Knight's pinball table in it because I love that game. But um, yeah, so I, I, I would probably say Sonic Adventure. I mean, that is the flagship title out of this this list, isn't it? So yeah, that's probably my, my pick. But yeah, Power Stone and, and Dynamite Cop in particular are like close... Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to spoil things and say mine as well. This is mine, Sonic Adventure. Uh, and I don't care who dumps on it. It's <laughs> People have bad hey, taste. Hey, enjoy okay. what you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I understand. I used to prefer Sonic Adventure 2 to this one. And as I got older, I, I find myself coming back to this one quite often and being able to play it. Like, unironically... This is one of my favorite games uh, ever. And uh, not so much Sonic Adventure 2, which I... Yeah. Back in the day, I thought, oh, Sonic Adventure 2 is amazing. It's like it's such a great story. It, like, it's so badass. And, like, they're, they're in space. Uh, but nowadays, there are a lot of, like, the gameplay elements of Sonic Adventure, uh, which make more sense to me than the ones in Sonic Adventure 2, particularly like Knuckles and Rouge, the Knuckles and Rouge stages are not as good as the Knuckles stages in Sonic Adventure 1. But uh, but I I understand. I understand. It, I hated that they got rid of the overworld kind of explorable like town and stuff as well. That was a bit of a, a step down in my opinion, you know. So, oh, and I like the way that you could just like pick who you wanted to to be whereas you know when i'm playing sonic adventure 2 i'm like oh i'm knuckles and i'm like looking for things and it's like not as interesting <laughs> i just want to go fast <laughs> that's a good point right so you, you can't like choose the order in which you do things right you have to play as this like in this specific order they they put out in, in front of you yeah yeah uh are any e102 gamma fans here oh yeah yeah <laughs> That was cool, yeah. <laughs> was, it, was he in Sonic here? Enthusiasm, yeah. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I like it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, th I think uh, Gamma's uh, stages are like um, the precursor of what Eggman and Tails were in Sonic Adventure 2. But I feel like the Eggman and Tails stages overstay their welcome <laughs> a little bit. So that's why I... I I actually prefer that. I don't know. Maybe it's a hot take. Andrew's like, like trying to control himself. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Yeah. I've just kind of, I've just zoned out. I'm just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Has your camera frozen again? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, oh, of, of course. And if we're going to talk about Sonic Adventure, we have to talk about Big the Cat. Right. The this is character. the best character ever. Like, yeah. I don't know why we haven't had, we've had Fearless, Year of Shadow the Hedgehog, but not like Lazy, Year of Big the Cat. <laughs> I would, I would be on board with that. I, I, I'm, I'm, my spirit animal is Big the Cat. That's all I know. Honestly, say. I think they should have done the new Sonic Generations reboot and had it instead of Shadow and Sonic, it should have just been Sonic and Big the Cat. That should <laughs> what that is what should have happened. <laughs> you speak the truth, my friend. Uh, uh, Big the Cat a spin off game or fishing. That will be great. Like Sega was fishing but with Big the Cat. Yeah. And yeah. It, and just Froggy. Yeah. You have to find Froggy <laughs> somewhere. 
like in, like in a big lake, you just have to find Froggy. And Froggy is hard to get as well. Yeah, that's that's what should happen. Make it happen, Sega. Make it happen. Okay, Andrew, what about your launch game of choice? There's a lot of good ones. I mean, Hydro Thunder is actually a really fun game, um, for instance. But, I mean, I got it with my Dreamcast, and so it has to be Power Stone. It's just such an incredible game. It is... I, I was never a Street Fighter fan, so Capcom Fighters, the 2D kind of fighters, which is my thing. Um, I kind of got into Tekken. That was okay. And then I got into Dead or Alive later, um, thanks to Dead or Alive 2. Um, but it was power stone that really got me into fighting games properly like the 3d arenas were incredible um the different characters and the powers that they had the weapons that you could find um the fact that, that collecting all three power stones to become like the super saiyan version of of your character was just like incredible uh it was just such a well put together game and all the stages were so i mean there's there's some stages that are better than others um like the london stage is incredible when you can pick up the billboard signs and throw them at people swing around the lamp post going to the fountain oh it's just uh it's probably one of the most perfect uh fighting games that there's ever been i get that power stone 2 is much better in terms of the fact you can play with more people and there's more weapons and stuff but i think that the the nature of everything being condensed into like this small cube of a level um with two people fighting each other it was just something about it that i really enjoyed um and i'm so so happy that they're bringing that now to switch with the with the new capcom fighting collection they're doing because that is well overdue for that to be on a console other than the dreamcast and the psp mm -hmm. uh so yeah i'm very excited for that and love love this game i could play this all day and, and never get bored of it so i I was just going to say, I know obviously it gets a lot of comparisons, like saying it's like it's uh, Smash Brothers on the Dreamcast. Um, mm. And, you know, obviously, you know, it's it's not completely the same, but I, I, I just feel like, you know, why did Capcom never continue this series? I just feel like it, it has so it had so much potential it's such an easy to pick up and play game as well like you know it, it's not like street fighter where if you play against someone who knows all the combos like i did re i went to an, an, the berry arcade club not too long ago and my friend's uh mate was there who's like an expert at street fighter and he I, I i literally i shouldn't have even bothered touching the buttons i did that much <laughs> he just absolutely whooped me and you know, this game, on the other hand, you can do, like, combos and stuff, but, like, you know, it's so easy to just run around, pick up weapons, you know, pick, like, like in the in the footage, picking up, like, furniture and lobbing them at each other. And, yeah, so it, 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 it's, it's excellent. I was just thinking about... I, I was listening to you and thinking about the definition or the use of the word arcade to refer sometimes to more, like, easier games and easier to pick up and play but usually 2D fighting games are not arcadey in that sense. They are really good arcade games, but they are not really that easy to, to master, right? Mm. Whereas something like Power Stone, you know, to master, not easy, but to pick up and like get a fighting chance and a winning chance. And also thanks to the, 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 the Power Stones as well, like the special attacks. It's it's more fun, I think, and it's like the the perfect arcadey type game, I think, as well. Uh, I'm I'm actually very curious to see how uh, it will translate online, because I believe you can play online in the this new like re-release. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, curious to, yeah, try it try it out. Um, so yeah, I actually was playing this yesterday. <laughs> this is not my footage, by the way. Shout out to World of Long Plays, which is a nice. Uh, YouTube channel that is great to to just show gameplay as we as we speak, but I was playing this yesterday and I really enjoyed myself. So I I never played this with friends back in the day, but I I believe it was like a very cool fun experience. Uh, so I'm definitely it's one of those you shout you shout at each other when you're playing this yeah. because you've kind of like somebody got the weapon you wanted or they throw something at you and you didn't see it and they or they get all the power stones or whatever it's like i, I remember shouting so hard power stone 2 as well of course you you've got four people to shout at each other but this was just yeah, <laughs> incredible unfortunately awesome. uh 
Power Stone doesn't work on my uh, Dreamcast that I got, the one I got like when I first started collecting. I tried, I think, two, three copies of Power Stone. It always crashes on spe- on a specific loading screen. Virtua Fighter 3 TB does it as well. The Japanese version, okay. you can play to completion. Um, and all I can find about that is that like IDOS blamed some of the specific Dreamcasts that were were made like they had like a dodgy drives or something but it's literally just those two games that don't play so who knows that's weird okay how many Dreamcasts do you have Lewis uh, I have two and a half <laughs> <laughs> yeah one, one of them needs repairing so yeah yeah <laughs> one's one's disc one's GDMU and the, the other one that's not not working is a disc one, yeah. Mm. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, so we we picked some some interesting uh, launch games. Were the games that you guys uh, mentioned the ones you would have picked up today if the Dreamcast launched on the fourteenth of October, twenty fourteen, with these nineteen games, or not, Andrews? Ooh, he's questioning his life choices now. I'm, I'm thinking about it. No, I, I think I, I think I would because I still don't like Sonic, Sonic Adventure. <laughs> so that wouldn't be one that I picked up. I don't, I don't hate it. I, I, I love the first level. They just for, sh- for shame. For um, shame. I know Sonic's just not for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, pa- Power Stone. I think that I, I would probably still pick that up because it, it's still a great fun game now. But then I think that probably all of the games on that list are still great fun games today. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we're on the Dream Pod with with Tom that you listened to the other day, he mentioned that UA for Striker is one that he would play. And I kind of questioned that. He went, oh, it's probably the best football game on the Dreamcast. So, of course, <laughs> you know. And it's like, oh, okay. I didn't realize that it was, it was that decent. So I think all of the games have stood up pretty well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think probably like kind of agreeing with Andrew. I mean, the thing is, that my kind of opinion on games were formed by the Dreamcast. I think, and I love. I think if I was to pick the games, though, they were, it would always be the colourful, like high energy ones. You know, something like Pen Pen appeals to me. Um, obviously, the ones we've mentioned, um, maybe like Toy Commander, Trick Style. You know, um, stuff like that. Uh, Definitely definitely would would have stood out to me and i suppose that's me just kind of being biased because the dreamcast is you know the kind of games i like <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i i actually remember something so with the dreamcast we also got a a demo disc dream on volume one and there were some games that i uh, vividly like remember and associate with the launch of the Dreamcast because I played them like the demos so much. Trick Style was one of them. Never was really good at it. <laughs> Toy Commander, uh, Re- Ready to Rumble Boxing, I remember that as well. Uh, was there anything else that I used to play? That was probably it, I think. Um, but I-, I remember spending a lot of time on the, the demos as well uh toy commander i actually got a lot like really into at some point um and then i ended up getting the the full game years later because i i mentioned this actually when i when i recorded for that portuguese pet podcast last week but what happened was uh when i started getting more like disposable income the dreamcast got discontinued uh, which didn't matter to me because I, I still bought a lot of games and now they were like on like heavily discounted. So I bought a lot of Dreamcast games and played them throughout the years, uh, even like well into the Wii era and the PlayStation 3 era. I still had my little Dreamcast connected to my like very small uh, TV, a CRT TV in my bedroom. Um, and really enjoyed my Dreamcast for a, a long, long time. So, were you? Uh, did you see any like sealed games? You know, did you use like eBay and stuff like that at the time? Not really. I bought them oh, all okay. at game stores here. There was a mm. specific one uh, that was close to. Then when I started working, close to my workplace, and they had like a whole section of Dreamcast games 
well into like 2005, perhaps six, I don't know. And they were heavily discounted. So <laughs> I ended up getting a lot of them because of that and, and still playing them. So that that's something that I don't think I ever did with any of the other consoles that I owned. So when when the uh, the new one, the next one came out, at some point I got the new one and like left the other one in the box or something. The Dreamcast was always uh, connected to my TV <laughs> in my bedroom. Did your did your it's... Dreamcast last? Do you still have your launch Dreamcast? It's this one that I showed you before. Yeah, I, that one, I, that's the one. there was a, there was a, a problem with the drive at some point, but I got it fixed. And so I actually bought another one because of that. The other one uh, actually had a problem with the drive as well. So I got got them both fixed. Now I have two working ones. Nice. Yeah. I remember I got um, I got mine and then it broke around the time that they were heavily discounting the Dreamcasts. So I think I got um, a new Dreamcast with Metropolis Street Racer, Jet Set Radio and Virtua Fighter. 3TB for I think it was less than a hundred pounds, maybe even less than that. I can't remember, but yeah, they were doing the whole bundle because they were just trying to get rid of them. Um, but I don't even know if that's the one that I have anymore because I then met my partner in university. He also had a Dreamcast, huge Sonic fan, loves Sonic, and at some point one of them got lost. So the one that I have now that's the original is either mine or his, and I don't know which it is. So mine is possibly lost in the ether somewhere. So. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Ash, how many Dreamcasts do you have? I don't know if I asked you. What? <laughs> Six. Oh, my God. Please <laughs> <laughs> yeah. explain. Between me and my partner, we have six. Okay. okay. Uh, the one I bought back then when I first had my Dreamcast, his first one. We had another one who is broken, a Japanese one, uh, one complete in box like new. And I think we had... Uh, two more because we, we had to have uh, more to play. <laughs> okay, of course. <laughs> you can never have enough Dreamcasts. Oh, of course not. Okay. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, I actually, there was something that I added to our outline. I said maybe our guilty pleasures. Do you guys have anything you can consider a guilty pleasure? Not really. I, I'm not going to be specific to this like launch window of games. Maybe you can. We can talk a lot like the whole Dreamcast catalog. Is there a game that you guys enjoyed or played the heck out of that you objectively think or know that is not a good game? <laughs> I have a couple. If if you need mm. me to go first. The, the only game I can think, think of that's a guilty pleasure is not necessarily objectively a bad game because it's not, but it's certainly one that I think a lot of people don't think of first when they think of the Dreamcast, and it's not something that a lot of people are that fond of. I know Lewis isn't, but mostly because he finds it difficult to play, and that's uh, Space Channel 5. Like, I, I was obsessed with Space Channel 5. I, I've completed that game 20 times. Um, I got a perfect run on one of them, like every single one, even the two after the credits. I got it because I played it 20 times and, and had memorized when everything came up. But yeah, I that's like such a guilty pleasure. Like everybody else, like people would come to my house to play games and I'd be like, I'm just going to do another run through of uh, Space Channel 5 first and then did the entire hour or so of Space Channel 5 before we'd play anything else. So uh, yeah, I was addicted to that. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a guilty pleasure. That's a very good game, actually. And it's one of those that I would have never gotten if not for, like, the heavily discounted section of Dreamcast get, cast games on my, like, local game store. Because it's not... I don't think I would ever have considered getting, like, a rhythm game. And, and yeah, so... So I, I, I feel, really... I feel like I feel like now it's probably definitely not a guilty pleasure, but I feel like at the time it maybe was because there's like that, you know, that it was like late nineties, early two thousands and all of your friends would be like, Oh, are you playing FIFA or are you playing this, that and the other. And there I was playing like a, a pink haired space reporter. Um, <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't the kind of game that everybody would be playing at the time. So I think it was a guilty pleasure 
in my friend group, <laughs> I, I would be looked down upon for playing this game. Um, I remember oh, my definitely. brother laughing at me several times for playing for playing Space Channel Five. But yeah, it's 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 objectively it's a very very good game. But um, yeah, at the time, maybe a bit like yeah, not so much. <laughs> I remember my mum uh, looking at the game and asking, "What the hell is that?" Obviously, she didn't say hell, <laughs> but okay, so. Uh, and I, uh, so she's a reporter and she's saving people and fighting aliens, of course. And she like just went away without saying anything else because why not? <laughs> and, the, and then there's Space Michael as well. So what's not yeah, to like? She teams up with Michael Jackson, yeah. Of course. Twice. 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 Exactly. <laughs> and the second like, one really even has Space like a Tom Jones version of a, a, of a, a song. So. It's brilliant soundtrack. Sorry, Ash, I interrupted you. I really love that game. I don't consider it my guilty pleasure because I am not ashamed of liking it. But <laughs> yes, I like, Good. Uh, no many people uh, understand I like that. It's uh, Sega Bass Fishing. I actually like it. <laughs> I like fishing in video game. And that's probably because of Pick the Cat. But... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I enjoy playing it. I'm, well, I'm not ashamed, but not many people uh, follow what I try to say when I when I play it and say, mm -hmm. play it, it's very fun. They, they don't. <laughs> I, I haven't played it that much, to be honest, but I, I, I don't consider it to be like a bad game either. I, it's like, it's a different kind of game. It's right. not that, that different. It's incredibly Sega. Mm -hmm. The same could be said about Space Channel Five. Of course, to be honest, of course. right? No way. I feel like I feel like we're going to say this about most games. I think that the, the truly guilty pleasures will be things like Spirit of Speed and The <laughs> Ring, Terror's Realm, and stuff like that. But uh, the only people I know who truly like those games are people like James Harvey. Um, I don't know if I know anybody who likes the Ring Terrors realm, but you know, uh, 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 Andrew, I was about to call that my guilty pleasure because that <laughs> really game, are. I, when I say guilty pleasure, like I don't enjoy playing that game. It's just I, I there was this one YouTuber called Spoonie who did a video on it, and some of the lines and the dialogue and just the whole premise of that game is hilarious. Like there's this one scene in it where the, the the main characters like hus husband or partner has just been killed by the 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 ring and um <laughs> she like breaks down crying and this random police officer who's at the crime scene just goes you okay lady like really like <laughs> i remember that it's flat I, yeah i remember and it, and seeing, like, yeah. seeing that somewhere I haven't played the game, but I remember that moment from somewhere. It's like her partner's just died. And he's just like, you're right there. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. And like the whole premise of the game, half of it is just walking around these office buildings. And it's just, yeah, it's it's bad. But um, it's a shame because like it would have been really cool to have a, a ring survival horror game. I'm sure Andrew can agree love the ring that's why that's kind of why i've never played it because i know i've i know the perception of it is terrible and i love the film so much that i didn't want to muddy my vision of the films by playing a game yeah. like that basically but now i feel like i should maybe yeah there's a bit where she like turns up to her office like the next day and she's like i can't mope around forever about my deceased partner and it's like dude <laughs> like <laughs> just take a day off <laughs> <laughs> the ring uh that that's i think this is a good guilty pleasure yeah um mine i think is also a good one which is 90 minutes uh another football oh, okay. game um so again it's not that i like it it's that i've spent a lot of time with it and I played it a lot. So um, I think it's a well-known fact that the Dreamcast wasn't really that great for like football slash soccer games for our American friends listening to us. Um, one of the and worst appar ones. <laughs> appar yeah, apparently UEFA Striker is the better, one of the better ones, apparently, uh, according to Tom, right? 
Uh, I didn't home, know yeah. that. I didn't know any better. So I got I got 90 minutes, which looked like, oh, this is like a brilliant game from the cover. It's like uh, you can... And the, the thing for me is you could customize like everything, like the teams, the the, the equipments, the, the names. You could like, customize everything. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit of footage from this, but it you really have to play this. You had all the tournaments as well with different names but you had like the world championship and things like that and so the thing that i spent the most time with was like customizing uh like adding a new team and customizing it to have to include the the, the names of all of my friends we had like a weekly oh. football game every weekend and so uh, we had the names of, like i had the, uh, the names of all of my friends like the correct positions uh, on the pitch and everything. Um, and yeah, but it's objectively a very, very bad football game. And I, I, I knew I that. <laughs> Sorry, I still on. played it. No, no. I was saying, I, I, I knew it was a bad game, but it was the one that I had on the Dreamcast and I played the heck out of it. I, I remember <laughs> Tom from the Junkyard wrote a, a blog about it and you know, he was giving it a play and he was sort of feeding back like his, 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 uh, um, reaction to it via like text message in our group chat for the junkyard. And I think he said something like I've, the goalie caught the ball and walked backwards into the goal and I got a point. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, yeah. that, that sounds about right. Yeah. That sounds about right. Um, um and what's and, interesting uh, is the the Japanese versions apparently better for some reason. I, I I think I read that on the on the the junkyard some mm. at some point. Um, I don't really remember why, but it's, it's not that much better either. It's like there's something <laughs> yeah. about it that's better, but like it's not as bad. Maybe that's the better way to, to put it. I think. Yeah, and this was dev developed by Smilebeard, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's the Which biggest crime of all. <laughs> interesting, right? <laughs> interesting. That is interesting. There is as well. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So they, they, that's yeah. one that they don't put on the like the website. Oh, we've developed this. <laughs> 90 minutes. Championship football or Sega championship football. This was the Sega football game, right? Because we had Sega Worldwide Soccer, but that was developed by, was it like Crystal Dynamics? I think so. You had Virtua Striker as well. You had Virtua Striker as well. Okay, yeah, but that's yeah. more like an arcadey type. Yeah. yeah, and this is like the proper sim mm -hmm. type game. Yeah, um, if football was boring, which I know for some people it is, uh, but okay. So that's my guilty pleasure. I've got, got one that is a Channel Five. Thank you. Will coming out of left field. Um, I'll, I'll remember Dragon Riders Chronicles of Perth. I don't even know what that is. Did you have that game, Andrew? I I did. Yeah, it's one that I sold, and I really regret it because I I did I didn't I didn't ever finish it, but I got quite far. And it's like it's an RPG that's based on like this novel series, um, and it's it's incredibly dull, but also because there were so few RPGs and stuff on the console, I actually quite enjoyed what I played of it. You actually get to, it's like the whole thing is that you can ride dragons and stuff. There's not that much of that in there because most of the time you're just walking around speaking to people. Um, but I, I quite enjoyed it. It was it was an interesting game. It looks awful. I mean, looking at it now, that looks absolutely terrible. Um, but it was fun. It, I, it, it was all right. I, maybe fun is too, too good of a word. It was all right. Is that a dragon like breathing in the background or is it the actual background moving for some reason? That will be a dragon. Yes, I, okay, a dragon. that okay, that's better then. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was like, Did you sell it for much, Andrew? <laughs> it was a long time ago that I sold this, so probably yeah. not. It was probably like when a, things was This is like a two hundred pound game now. It is yeah. ridiculously pricey. Really? It's one of those that <laughs> Yeah, if I want, I don't, I don't think they printed that many of them. I think it's quite rare because it's um, there wasn't that many actually printed. Um, but yeah, it's uh, along with Project Justice. It's one of the games I wish I could buy back, um, but can't because it's far too expensive now. <laughs> and you had a belt knife. I got the game too because I I love the the book series, 
and I always wanted to play the game, but it's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Was it like fully voice acted as well? I don't recall. I think there was some voice acting. I don't okay. know if it was full on everything. At least yeah, it let's find out. I don't think I can share audio, but I can. Yeah. Crappy voice acting, but it's okay because it's that's yeah. what 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 was supposed to happen back in that time. Yeah. House exactly, of the Dead yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even Shenmue. Uh, but okay, but it makes it better, right? <laughs> Let, let's let's go with that. <laughs> but you've you've learned about a new Dreamcast game now, and not yeah. that you can afford to buy it, but you can try and find a way to play it for sure. For sure, for sure. Uh, uh, Dragon Riders Chronicles of Pern. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing the pain. <laughs> You're welcome. Guilty pleasure. It was some pleasure. Some. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so we're, we're uh, very close to like rounding this out with like the, the legacy of Dreamcast. I, I just wanted to mention something briefly. So uh, I already talked about the Dreamcast being uh, at the Big Brother house in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> which is like a big pop culture moment i think i i would like to know the like the effect of that in terms of sales i would love to know that it's very hard to find anyone uh, connected to echo films here in portugal to, to talk to I, I i've tried to find people but it's really really hard if you're somehow listening to this and you're part of the the history of the dreamcast or sega in portugal let me know, podcast at thesegalounge.com. We would love to, to hear from you and interview you on the show. But That'd be so interesting. <laughs> really nice, because I, I, I have very fond memories of those days and like having the uh, Sega Club as well here. Uh, I was a member of the Sega Club here, like getting letters from Sonic the Hedgehog himself. <laughs> was amazing. <laughs> Uh, but having said that, that's one of like those pop culture moments here that we remember from the Dreamcast days in, in Portugal. Is there anything like that that you guys remember or uh, have researched uh, in the UK, in Spain, anything you'd like to mention? The, the biggest one for me was that they got Lara Croft to advertise the Dreamcast here, which was, I don't know if that was the same in, in Europe in general, but we had advertisements, um, wasn't at launch, but it was like during the life of the Dreamcast. And that was quite interesting. I know that they had a uh, like a Tomb Raider game on Dreamcast, but it was kind of just interesting that Lara Croft and Dreamcast were on, in adverts. There was TV adverts, there was print adverts. Um, and I think that got a lot more people, especially in my friend group, to talk about it because they love Tomb Raider, they love Lara Croft, and all of a sudden she was there like holding a CGI Dreamcast. Um, I remember so that, was that kind here. Of, that was an interesting thing. Yeah. I remember that. Was it like the last revelation of the game? I think so. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the one. Chronicles as well. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, my big one is I remember Arsenal, uh, the, the British uh, FA Cup. I'm not very good at football, but and obviously Arsenal, the, the team. Um, yeah. They they had Dreamcast on their kit. I think uh, maybe the goalie had like Sega. Uh, it was it's just the away and uh, home kits. They differed, and you know Thierry Henry, like he was like the biggest footballer. Like obviously not not being like the biggest football fan myself, but I knew who he was. And you know he you can see find photographs online of him like with with the Dreamcast. Um, you know, football strip, or even I think even holding a Dreamcast. So, you know, and I think obviously Arsenal were doing like really well during that time as well. So, but I guess it didn't sell that many Dreamcasts, unfortunately. <laughs> and, there, were, and, uh, there were four football teams, weren't there? Because there yeah. I think there might have been a Spanish one as well. The, the, uh, uh, the, Deportivo the, La Coruña, right? Yeah. Deportivo yeah. De La Coruña. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sampdoria in Italy and Saint Etienne in France, I believe, were the four. Yeah. And I, I think uh, apparently the, the 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 portion of the budget of the marketing budget they spent on this alone was insane. Uh, so I, I would yeah. really love to know <laughs> the payoff of this <laughs> for Sega, because uh, I don't know. And especially I don't know if were the teams 
well picked. I'm, I mean, I remember Arsenal. I'm not very familiar with the Italian and French, and French teams. Uh, I, I remember at some point, maybe the, during these times, La Coruña was like doing really well, probably. Am I right, Ash? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it, it was good. It's not of the biggest teams in Spain, but back in that time, it was uh, doing really good. So I think it was a good idea to to marketing it up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the logic was behind this because uh, thinking about like the colors, Arsenal is red, right? La Coruña, blue, blue and white. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the other ones, but uh, uh, it doesn't really. It's that's not the reason, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so, my I favorite don't know. tidbit about the Arsenal team is that their goalkeeper was called David Seaman. Exactly. Well, Seaman, but uh, Seaman. Yeah. So he had Dreamcast yeah. on the front and Seaman on the back, and that's just brilliant. <laughs> I wonder if he, anyone ever told him like. You know, Guerrilla marketing kind of, for the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did they ever? Uh, that that's something that I have always wondered. Did they ever take advantage of that, like to promote the game? Probably not, right? Like no, they should have. Well, it have. wasn't released in Europe, was it? So like. Oh I yeah, that's really that's matter. a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Saint Etienne Green, Green, uh, and. Uh, Septoria like blue and bits of white and red and black like stripes. So not really. A... I feel like we, I feel like we spoke to Giles a little bit about that in the podcast that you mentioned. I feel like he spoke about that as well. And I think the amount that they spent on it was like so much that they had to cut back on all of the marketing that they just didn't have enough to to, to market. And that's why you got so few adverts uh, in any other format. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it didn't really work that well because, you know, I, I think the, the the idea was footballers also like to play games. So let's get the football crowd. And it's like, mm, <laughs> didn't quite mm. work. Yeah. I, I think I, I find it interesting that they had like, we all play games. Why don't we play together? That was like, apart from the yeah. up to six billion players part that was scratched. But um this is an, an, an interesting idea. I, I find the, the marketing strategy for the Dreamcast in Europe to be quite fascinating, especially since they never showed, or at, at the, the time of they launched, they never showed like the games themselves, um, which is interesting because they were targeting a different demographic and focusing on the, the aspect of playing together. Uh, but I don't know how impactful that was. I don't know if it hindered the, the success of the console, if it helped. I have no, uh, no idea. I have no idea. Um, I, I actually found a quote that I used on another episode of the show when we had Brian Shea, former director of, of Game Informer on the, on the show, we talked about like Sega games on, on Nintendo consoles. Uh, and I found a quote by uh, the vice president of strategic planning and corporate affairs at Sega of America, Charles Belfield, uh, in November 2001. And he said something interesting. <laughs> he said, um, the Dreamcast was essentially hugged to death by consumers and gamers everywhere. In hindsight, everybody adored the product. It's still considered one of the best game platforms ever created for the price and the content that we had on it in the first two years. And this is the interesting part of the quote. It was those who didn't buy the Dreamcast that eventually killed the product. <laughs> That's some interesting logic. <laughs> That's true of everything that failed then. <laughs> right? Right? So the people who didn't buy the Dreamcast were the ones who killed the console, not the ones who bought it. I never knew that. That's that's a very interesting quote by Charles Belfield. If you're listening to this, Charles, come on the show. Let's talk. Uh, <laughs> explain it. Let's explain this better. I, th I think it's really interesting, though, that I guess obviously it didn't do as well as it, sh it we needed it to. But I think Andrew, you you said on like an old 
dream pod that it did better than the Saturn in Europe and America. Whereas, like, I think if you look at the the sale, so it sold us about the same as the Saturn, but it did better in the West. So it can't they it, they kind of got us a little bit. They kind of won us back over, but not enough, unfortunately. Anyway, it was kind of dead of dead at arrival, right? So they were. <laughs> It was not the, the Dreamcast. The problem wasn't the Dreamcast. <laughs> um, the problem was Sega. That was yeah. the, that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, I, I so that back back to those like Portuguese articles that I found about the Dreamcast. So uh, one that is much more recent uh, said something like like I think during the like the 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 20th anniversary celebrations or something, a Portuguese article said, uh, even though it was seen as a failure, the Dreamcast was worth it. And I, I think this uh, quote uh, like perfectly translates my feelings towards the console as well, probably you guys as well. Um, so I, I wanted to, to mention the, the legacy of this, of this little box and the blue swirl. Um, by talking about what it meant to us and what it still means to us. Um, maybe I, I'm going to go with Lewis first as the head honcho of the Dreamcast junkyard. <laughs> what, what does the Dreamcast still mean to you? And, and is it any different from what it meant to you when you first got it and when you first experienced games on it? Um, We're going well. deep, people. Very deep. Well, yeah, like I, I feel like with the, the Dreamcast is is good is important for me because I, d I don't think it is just the case that I'm like blinded by nostalgia. I think that actually the more you know, obviously I have all the games that I loved back when I first discovered it, but you know, discovering all the things I didn't know about it, it's just such a fascinating piece of gaming history. You know, I remember when I first joined the junkyard chatting to Mike Phelan and he's written that A to Z guide um, and there's just so many cool games and it's like, how did this console fail with this many cool games, you know? And um, yeah, and I obviously being with the junkyard, like it just continues to impress me, you know, with like brand new games coming out, the the homebrew that's going on, like the fact that people are doing a really impressive job of getting Grand Theft Auto 3 running on it, for example. Um, and, you know, people often talk about piracy being one of the things that, that uh, you know, killed the Dreamcast, but actually it's one of those sort of, happy accidents because the fact that it's so easy to you know uh, run like you know uh, illegal software on has meant that you know the indie scene and and the homebrew scene can uh, are still flourishing whereas you know no one talks about ps2 indie games it's like well you know so technically the dreamcast outlived the ps2 in some way <laughs> and and you know what the the best like the best selling peripheral for the Dreamcast was the holder, right? The, the black yes. holder, the PS2 <laughs> was the best selling peripheral. That's a bad joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ash, what does the Dreamcast mean to you? Well, it's. This is, this is yeah. like therapy yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like therapy because. I didn't have Dreamcast, so I don't have that kind of feeling of losing something I loved back in the day. But at the same time, I feel like Dreamcast is the last, uh, last, mm, uh, last thing of classic gaming. I feel like it's, it's the last the classic uh, game console. The console who came before, we can consider it retro now. But the feeling of the games um, are different of what Dreamcast and um, game before were. That arcade feeling that was lost. And Dreamcast was the last time we had that as a mainstream in, in gaming. So I, I miss it a lot. I miss that era of gaming, that way of making games. And Dreamcast is like the, the poster chip for that.
So yeah, it's, I really miss that. Agreed. Agreed. Andrew. Gosh, I mean, <laughs> so I so I, I credit Dreamcast with kind of properly making me love games. Like I played games up until that point, and yes, I loved things like Resident Evil. But it wasn't until I got and played the Dreamcast that I had a proper appreciation for like the full spectrum of gaming, not just a survival horror game that I had an obsession with. You know, it was all these different games that I'd never got to play before. It was all the arcade stuff. It was Shenmue. It was like Fancy Star Online. So many different kinds of games. And, you know, that was the reason that we got a lot of that is because Sega was trying to throw everything at the wall to make it stick, to make it a success because they knew what kind of trouble they were in. And without it having been in that trouble, we wouldn't have the Dreamcast that we had. We wouldn't have the the games that we have. Um, so it means a lot to me for the fact that it kind of brought me into gaming, as it were. And then obviously, however many years later, about five or six years ago, it kind of brought me into the career that I'm in now, which is to be able to talk about games and to, to publish things about games. And I got into that because I wrote a book about the Dreamcast, uh, you know, which is my favorite console of all time. So it, it means a lot to me because it's my, not only my gaming history, but also my life now, because I've gotten into a career that I really wanted because of the Dreamcast, really. And I think that, you know, the legacy that it leaves is that, you know, it's a legacy of what a game company can do when it's let loose when it's freed from the shackles of you know having to make a, a sequel to a popular game that they need to make this money to i mean they they really say gaga for crying out loud um, a game that <laughs> made, uh, and th- no sane game company would have done that at the time and it's the fact that they weren't saying that they were just trying anything that was so great um and i think that's the kind of thing that we need to remember for the dreamcast for i know some people get stuck on it, it failing and blaming parties for that, like PlayStation 2 or, so, 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 you know, Sony. Um, and I know some people still feel like raw about that to this day that, oh my God, so, you know, Sony killed the Dreamcast. And I'm like, well, no, Sega killed the cast realistically, that it was never going to survive. They were going bankrupt. And the only reason they didn't is because somebody forgave debt to them. Um, and I think you just have to be thankful that we had the Dreamcast at all. Like you said, the, you know, the fact that we even got to have that is is fantastic. So that's a legacy it leaves, along with the fact that it is an incredible indie machine now. Um, it's just, you know, we got some incredible games that you would never have seen otherwise if it wasn't for this kind of melting pot of of things that happened at the, at the right time. For sure. And Sony didn't kill the Dreamcast. The people who didn't buy the Dreamcast killed it. Remember that. Yeah. Always remember that. Waiting uh, <laughs> <laughs> for playing uh, and to buy PS2, get the drink. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I actually, I remember. I, I mentioned this on the show several times, but I, I had a like a classmate at the time that uh, when I when I first met him. Uh, we started talking about like games and stuff. And I said, oh, I'm really excited about the Sega Dreamcast. It's coming soon. And it was like, the Sega Dreamcast, that sucks. I'm just going to wait for the PS2. That's going to like blow it out of the, the water. Um, and I never spoke. I've never spoken to him again. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. So he used to make fun of me for being a Sega fan and for getting the Dreamcast. Uh, and we actually like made a bet that the PS2 would would fail. Of course, I lost that bet, uh, sadly. But it's kind of like the the mindset of the general public, the general gaming public at the time, right? Uh, there wasn't much that could have been done by Sega to change things. Uh, but it was. Like that article said, it was worth it. I think the Dreamcast was worth it, and we should be thankful for uh, having this little box that still plays a lot of great games. Even like you guys said already, great indie games, like great ports of otherwise impossible games uh, to run on the Dreamcast or to have been released on the Dreamcast. Um, it it's it really has. I think Ash, you you put it in a, a, a wonderful way when you said it's like the, the last bastion of like classic gaming. It 
to me, it's the end of like Blue Sky Sega. I know that Sega still released some of the Dreamcast games on on other consoles and still released some things like, for example, Billy Hatcher comes to mind um, on the GameCube and stuff. But Dreamcast was like the uh, last piece of Sega hardware and uh, like the last testament of blue skies sega for me but it's it's still going on we actually had some interesting like series starting on the dreamcast so for example shen who started on the dreamcast it's still going uh hopefully <laughs> at least we had another game after that uh on on more modern consoles jet set radio was a series that started on the, on the Dreamcast. Sonic is still going. <laughs> and so, the Sonic Adventure games on the Dreamcast and GameCube were successful. Um, can you think of any others that uh, we had? Virtue Fighter, although that's kind of stuck in limbo. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. You crazy taxi soon, so... Crazy yeah. sexy. Yeah, Soul yeah. Calibur. That's not okay. Sega, but it's a series, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I, the I, NBA I think NBA many people going. associate Soul Calibur with good. Dreamcast still, though. Yeah. yeah. And, and NBA 2K. Yes, sorry, Andrew. I interrupted you there. Yeah. Okay. How dare if, you? <laughs> if you could, if you could, uh, so you already know that uh, Jesse Radio, Crazy Taxi, uh, and that's it, I think, in terms of Dreamcast. Uh, but those two series are getting uh, new games soon. Uh, Soon-ish. We don't know much about them at this moment. If you could pick, and this is your challenge, Andrew. You, you said you were nervous about the challenge. This is your challenge. <laughs> if you could pick one of the, this, the, one of the Dreamcast games that you love, to have like a reboot or a remake or a sequel in 2024, what would it be? Skies of Arcadia. That was quick. Easy. Yeah, Skies of Arcadia. That that game has been overlooked for far too long, um, and it needs a, a remaster slash remake and then a sequel because that is an incredible game. It has a brilliant story. They created a, an amazing world. It's really sad because the the director of that game passed away. I think a year or two ago um reiko kadama um so the likelihood of that happening is probably much less now but yeah it, it's such an incredible game um that just doesn't get the love that it deserves it does from dreamcast fans but people outside that don't really see it maybe some of the gamecube fans as well because it, it really i, I think that's i think that's a, a a good point that what you just mentioned i think the fan base for skies of arcade is larger than sega realizes it at at points mm. i think i think there would be like a, a massive chunk of nintendo fans that would love to have a new or a remake or a re-release of skies of arcadia because i've seen yeah. nintendo fans mention that game not like th it's like th there's a massive uh fan base mm -hmm. but it's a, a good chunk of people yeah Love and it was it was they they got the they got the better version as well because they had the uh the random battles reduced so mm -hmm. you know Damn them. I, I sat through all of those random battles, damn it. <laughs> Every single one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lewis, if you could pick one to, to come back. Yeah, I mean, if if it hadn't have had a, 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 a reboot announced, like I think it was this year, I would have said Jet Set Radio. Although I would also say that bomb bomb rush cyberfunk is kind of the jet set radio game i wanted i'm a little bit cyn cynical about what sega are going to produce because like, i don't really like the look of like the way they've made beats and everything but you know i'd like to be happily um proven wrong but um i i know it's not a sega um property but i just doesn't a have power to be. stone yeah okay. a power stone three for me you know, online, uh, you know, the only thing with that is I'd worry that they'd, they'd make it too much like the first game. Whereas I think if you, to, to appease 
nerds like me, you'd have to have a little bit of two in there somehow. But um, you know, with the you know the thing with like you see, you see sort of like Smash Brothers with all these big tournaments and the, all these people who like are obsessed with that game, and it's like I, Capcom have just let I said it before, Capcom have just let such a good franchise just you know peter out and not really go anywhere. Obviously, we're going to get it online again, so hopefully that can form some form of you know revival you know uh people can discover it maybe which would be really good so let's see yeah that's a good shout yeah ash well maybe a bit uh something everybody is going to say but i want uh shamu four i really love uh one two and three even if people did not like it about i loved it I, I need to know how the story ends. And please, please, Yu Suzuki, if you're hearing me, please finish the story at four. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great. It's time to see if, 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 if you're not going to do more than four, if lucky. So please, finish the story. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we need. Powerful, a powerful request here. I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I, if if I be realistic, yeah, that's that's probably the way to go, right? Finish at four. <laughs> yeah, just got like uh, reduce the gameplay bits and like add more cutscenes to tell the story, and like try to squeeze it in the, the fourth game. Maybe, maybe that's the way to go. So I, I'm obviously up for a Shenmue four. You know, you know, guys, you know, that's my favorite game of all time, Shenmue. Shadow one and two, especially. Um, I I was gonna steer away from that, steer clear from Shenmue, because people are always saying that I'm I, I talk too much about Shenmue. Uh, I was gonna mention not enough. A, not enough. That's true. <laughs> that's that's the actual truth there. Um, but I was gonna mention another series that started on the Dreamcast and that I was forgetting. It was amazing. Virtual Tennis. Virtual oh, Tennis. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I think. And, and we got a few sequels. We went up to four, I believe. Uh, and some like on the PSP and PS Vita. And like there's a mobile version as well, which is still available to play. And it's still a, a great little game. Uh, but I, I would love like a Virtua Tennis 5 or something or like... Virtual tennis, but call it call it the way you did in the during the in the, the in the US, like like tennis, two K fifteen or something, or virtual tennis two K fifteen if you if you'd like to. Uh, but I would love to get a, a new virtual tennis, and of course ninety minutes. A new ninety minutes is a must. Like uh, <laughs> uh, ninety minutes. VAR version or a VAR edition or something like that. I don't know. Make it. Uh, topical or I don't know, maybe maybe something like that. 90, 90 plus five minutes. Uh, I have no clue. <laughs> but Shenmue and Virtue Tennis. I also forgot about Space Channel 5, also a series that started on the Dreamcast. There was a VR game uh, released outside of the Dreamcast. Um... And I think I, I remembered... Oh, Fantasy Star Online also started on Dreamcast. And now we have two, uh, which I believe is a fairly successful MMO for people who are still into that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so a lot of things that started on the Dreamcast and, uh, and are still going. Okay. So I wanted to close this out by with a, like a, a quick fire uh, round. It's just one question. Your favorite Dreamcast game. We've probably mentioned this somewhat, right? But you can only choose one. And I'll go first. Shenmue. <laughs> so from my left to my right, Lewis. Um, Shenmue to... Oh, mm. Power Stone 2, that's my favorite final answer. Okay. And your answer is incorrect. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Andrew. There's so many. I, I, I honestly have about five or six that are on, at number one altogether. But if you have to push me, um, it's probably Shenmue, to be perfectly honest. So, okay. yeah. Okay. 
Good man. Ash, and why <laughs> is it Shenmue? No, <laughs> <laughs> Shenmue, I love it, but no, my favorite game, not only in Dreamcast, but it's uh, like a, a stepping stone, like the, the base of my personality and what, who I am, it's Sonic Adventure 2. So that is my favorite game. That makes sense. That makes sense. It's a, a good answer. Good answer as well. Okay, very good. So this is it. We're celebrating 25 years of the Dreamcast in Europe. I shouldn't say Europe. I should say like PAL regions, right? There would be mm. more. Yeah. But, but then Australia again. There's Australia as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so happy 25th anniversary to the Dreamcast, to the box of dreams that we're still so uh, in love with after all these years. Also, we're old guys, okay? Never forget that. Never forget that. It's really, really, really sad. <laughs> uh, and looking back, I've had my Dreamcast for most of my life, which is kind of amazing now, uh, looking back. Um, so thank you very much, Louis, Andrew, and Ash, for, for joining me for this special episode before we go, I wanted people to know where they can find you online and please feel free to share any projects you're working on, Sega or otherwise. And so I'm going to give you some more screen time. Uh, Lewis, let's start with you. Hello, I am Lewis from the Dreamcast Junkyard. You can check out the Dreamcast Junkyard at www.thedreamcastjunkyard.co.uk. I'm on Twitter at Lewis JFC. And also, yeah, I, I've i mentioned this before, but I want to plug it. Uh, go check out the Nakaruru Dreamcast English fan translation that I was the lead editor for. And previous Sega Lounge guest, Derek Pascarella, was heavily involved with. In fact, he was the brains behind the whole operation, to be honest. But yeah, go check that out and... Uh, discover a new dreamcast game today i like that last one yeah discover discover a new dreamcast game today nice yeah, it's not really a game it's just a big a big reading exercise but you should check it out yeah a labor of love so definitely recommend it thank you lewis andrew dickinson it's me um <laughs> you can find me online at oddman84 um on x or twitter or whatever you want to call it and i'm obviously on the dreamcast junkyard too um as i work at debug magazine which is an indie game magazine we did a whole article on indie dreamcast games at one point because i just do that in everything that i'm in and um, you can find <laughs> that at, uh, I think it's at, at debug magazine or you can go to teamdebug.com um you can buy my dreamcast books if you'd like to go to bit.ly forward slash dcy digital because i only have digital copies left i also just started a new company called uh, gamebound uh, which is publishing magazines and our first one's called generations we just successfully crowdfunded that it will be available to buy and it does have a an article on virtual tennis uh casey so you'll be you'll be pleased to know that uh, in that nice. magazine um but yeah uh, but before i before i leave as well i wanted to share one small anecdote you mentioned you got a free keyboard with the online thing for portugal yeah. is that right yeah that's true we, we didn't get that here we got like Choo, Choo rocket for nearly free it was like five pounds um but i did we went on a trip to france um when i was 16 and just after i got the dreamcast and i bought a keyboard from france and i'd gone with it and set it up to play fancy star online and only then did i realize that all countries in europe have different keyboard layouts and I have no idea on it. What out ever again? <laughs> Waste of money. <laughs> was it was it expensive? I don't remember I, how much um, it was here. I think it was like because it would have been would would it have been what Euros came in in two thousand, right? I think the Euro the Euro. Two thousand so yeah, right? And that was yeah, the year Ash that I got helped it, me so out here. Was it 2000? I think so. I think we're transitioning, right? 2000 to 2002, yeah. I think we were transitioning. To your... So it was it was around then. So I w it would have been, I think it was like 15, it was 15 to 18 euros or something. I think it was. So oh. it wasn't horribly expensive. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's all right. Yeah. And it's nice to fight fight zombies. If <laughs> yeah, if you've got the right letters in the right place. <laughs> sure. At least you can like use it as like a, a throwing 
weapon or something. I don't know. Beat somebody with it. Yeah, yeah beat, beat some. <laughs> yeah, beat some zombies. Uh, okay. <laughs> Great. And so check out Andrew. Andrew's works. And remember, yeah, yeah. Filmcast here. This is the first one. Oh, and and you have the. Can, can you show us the, the the third one, the cover for the third oh, one again? Okay. Yeah. I'll show it again. We're not actually, um, we don't have a solid date for doing this. I think me and Lewis have been chatting about this for probably two years at this point. Um, <laughs> so, but we will, I, I do want to do it because it'll be the last book in the series and I do want to make yeah. sure that I close it out. So uh, at some point in, I can't even say the near future, but at some point in the future, there will be a third book in that, in that series. Is, but the the first two are, are pretty good on their own. I think uh, I would. Uh, it's, I, I'm saying that myself, of course. But I, I, think they're, they're <laughs> I agree. Books, so. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, and of course, we will have uh, Dreamcast here three whenever we get Shenmue four. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Ash, <laughs> where can people well, find you? Well, people can find me at a uh, at Twitter or X. That my personal account, and I also have a YouTube channel where we talk about uh, everything retro games and the series we especially like, like Sonic, uh, Resident Evil, Mortal Kombat, and a bit of everything. Also, we have uh, Sonic Paradise, which is uh, the Spanish, long, long Spanish language, biggest uh, Spanish fan site. We also have that at uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, X, well, it's, it's Twitter, uh, <laughs> Facebook, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Threads. Uh, we, we're everywhere. Everywhere. That's <laughs> it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and YouTube. Yeah, too. And TikTok. I, I, I there's too, too many. It's everywhere, everywhere. Just YouTube. look for oh, Sonic right. Paradise, right? Yeah, but our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, is uh, from me and my partner, aside from Sonic Paradise, who also has a YouTube channel, uh, where we talk about uh, games and stuff in Spanish, of course. Of course. And we'll, we'll link all of those in the show notes as well. And also, uh, a big shout out to your partner as well, Ash, for like, contributing he's, he's there. in the, in the yeah, background, there. right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, contributing in some way to this episode. Of course... We're the Seg Lounge. Thank you for listening slash watching. Remember, uh, all episodes now have video versions on, on YouTube or current episodes. I'm going to be, as time goes on, as I have more free time, I'll upload some video versions of past episodes because I've been recording video for a while, but I've only been uploading video versions uh more recently but if you're into that sort of thing uh, if you want to see more of this old mug just check out our youtube channel uh if you don't want to be bothered by the the ugly visuals you can listen to us always wherever you get your podcasts and this was a very special episode, but we'll, we have more. We actually have more specials coming uh, until the end of the season, other topics that we'll cover, uh, and some interesting interviews. So do join us for that. Guys, again, thank you very much for joining me. Would it be, would it have been fun without you? I, ha I can tell you that. Just me sharing my memories of Dreamcast eh, would be boring. So thank you very much for joining me. Uh, and thank you everyone for watching. See you guys next week. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>
a Mixed On Productions podcast.